This is obviously just dump sites. It's a lot of work out here. Honestly, three 40 yard dumpsters might not even be enough. The desert, I mean, it's it's a very unique place. It's a mix of brutality and beauty. There's so much life going on in the desert. At the same time, looking like complete death out there sometimes. There's tons of artifacts. There's tons of ghost towns and mines. And it's a package deal. I think it's just the vastness and the openness of the whole thing. And there still is a lot of open access land. And just go explore and potentially find somewhere where no one's ever been before. Have you heard of the Grand Canyon? That's a wonder of the world. Pretty much any part of this state you go to, you can find beauty in it. It's undeveloped, it's still raw. I mean, people say it all the time, you know, Arizona is still the Wild West, and that's the absolute truth. There's sunsets and sunrises that you'll never see anywhere else out here. Almost every morning when you wake up in the Arizona desert, there's always kind of like this dew in the dirt. It has like a very distinct smell. It, nothing beats it. It's a brutal landscape that if it's not respected and treated right, it will bite back. It's just a different world than your typical, you know, guy living in the city who just is living their nine to five and going home. The off-road community is awesome. Everybody just wants to help each other. You wanna just winch me here or should I back back down? If I ever needed anything, like I have people that follow me on social media and I follow them on social media and I've literally never met them in real life, but they've offered to send me parts, help me out, do whatever they thought that they could do to try to help me out when I was in hard times. So it's just a really close-knit community. We're a brotherhood and a sisterhood, no matter what. If it's a Jeep, a Toyota, a Mitsubishi, whatever is out there on the trail, it doesn't matter what it is. We're gonna ask if, if they're broken down on the side of the road. You guys covered, you got everything under control. Is anybody hurt, you know, you're gonna cover, make sure everything is good. The day I met one of my really good friends, he, his whole entire back wheel was off of his truck. And so it was like, that's how we met. So it's one of those things and it's how it goes. Everyone has that same positive energy and that willingness to help and that, will, and that want to go explore. You know, it's, it's an amazing community. When you talk about the off-road community, it's 
there's the 20% of us that are basically like a family. Look at this dude, getting ready for his desert wedding here. I actually reconnected with Ricky, my fiance now, uh, through my buddy Ethan that runs the State 48 Off-Road uh, Instagram page. You got this, come on boy. Get it! Went on a couple dates and here we are. We own a house, we bought a house this year. We have 80,000 shitbox vehicles in the driveway and... Now we're married and it's all thanks to this hobby. It's freedom in all different kind of ways. It's physical freedom, it's mental freedom. You're, you're getting away from all the traffic, all the hustle and bustle of the city and all the craziness that's been going on in the world and stuff. And then mentally too, like there's nothing, when it's just you and your truck and a dirt road, that's all you're thinking about. That's all you're worrying about is that next turn, that next boulder right there. You're not thinking about the 20 other things you have to do once you get back home. A lot of people think of it, I think, as machine versus nature, which it's not. It's man versus machine. Guys that build their trucks and build these rigs and put investments and money and stuff like that, they want to go out there and then test them. They want to see what they've built and put it to the test and really, really challenge themselves and their knowledge of their vehicle. You want to get down. I plan on breaking stuff anytime we go out. Like, I want to test my limits, my skills. I want to see what the vehicle's capable of doing. I've been doing this long enough that I have enough tools and I always keep spare parts that I never get stranded. I mean, I've had to ratchet strap my vehicle, my frame back together to make it all the way home from Payson. So you do what you have to do. I'm a little bit different. I like to go out and get away from noise, get away from pavement and find something. You know, we've accidentally found petroglyphs. We've accidentally found mines and ghost towns and things like that because we've gone out to look for them. You know, my wife and kids, they've always been a part of it with me. So, you know, both my kids are teenagers. My son's 19, my daughter's 16. They'll still jump in the Jeep and go out exploring. I just picked this up like a month and a half ago. It's my 88 Toyota pickup. My very first car was my grandfather's old Jeep. So, always been into Jeeps. Every time I drive my truck, I say I love this thing. I take a lot of pride in it, but I like to have a lot of fun, you know? I like to send it. I am the taco wrangler. I know my vehicle, I know what it's capable of, I feel comfortable doing the most absurd things, and I feel safe. My main off-roading rig is a, a 1987 Suzuki Samurai. I guess it was a Suzuki Samurai. Now it's kind of a cobbled together vehicle of, of, you know, I've got Chevy Astro van steering and Toyota axles under it. There's nothing on it that I can't do myself. One truck part, another truck part, and another truck part. Here we are. I can't stop building things. <laughs> it's, I mean, call it an addiction or what. I, I get so many ideas in my head and I just build, man. Ricky thinks it's an obsession or an addiction. And in a way it kind of is, because like I literally eat, sleep, and breathe these vehicles. It's the fact that I don't have to worry about it at all. I mean, it's, I don't care if I flip it over, I don't care if I bash it into a rock, I don't care if I dent it, scratch it, crush it, you know, what, whatever, it's, it's just parts. Dude, like, let's go wheel. Let's go out there, let's air down. Let's go put our trucks in four high. Let's go party, dude. Do you like to party or not? And they're like, yeah, bro. And I'm like, well, let's go, bro. Like, come on. So then we go out there, we hit the trail. We finally get to put it in four low, climb a hill. Everybody is just like, this is it. What more do you need? I mean, bring snacks. <laughs> at university here.
tell anyone I'd be it's just gun ho to go out and do it by themselves because I mean having someone that has a winch or I mean too you just want a spotter in general too someone standing outside your vehicle yeah, let me watch your drive shaft now helping you spot and place your tires appropriately and stuff because the line you pick is what makes it if you're actually making the climb or not a lot of vehicles can do a lot of things as long as you pick the right line pick that right tire placement and like it's very hard to see when you're going up like a waterfall and all you're looking at is a blue sky oh, there's fire. you always got to look at it beforehand kind of map it out in your mind and then as you're doing it what you mapped out in your mind you're imagining the tires going over that bump so it's okay okay the front tire did this bump the rear tire is about to do it now so you it's all just picturing it in your mind's eye and feeling it as you go unless of course you have a spotter then they'll help direct where you turn and things like that so i've been in rollovers not in my personal rigs but riding with friends and stuff and it's crazy how fast everyone just stops what they're doing and comes together when something like that happens. Figure if my s broke, might as well put on a show, right? I rolled my samurai over and within 15 seconds, we literally pushed it back over on its side. I mean, not everything only weighs 1,300 pounds, but still, I mean, if you, if you can't do that or if you don't have someone with you who knows how, you need to learn how or find someone who can or just not do it. I wasn't a new off-roader, I had been off-roading my entire life, but it was a way for me to break into this hobby with a group of people that were gonna show me how to do it right. A lot of people may think that the off-roaders are out there tearing up the desert versus that's kind of the opposite for us, you know? Well, we take it with ease and clean it up on our way out, you know? So it's, I think that's what's important is to get everyone's mind on uniting and getting together and having a great adventure and also making a difference. Off-roaders and stuff care more about the land than a lot of people think we do because without that, our passion, our drive, it, it's gone. We have nowhere else to go. If you can make your way on a trail, you're gonna find trash, bet on that and if you don't then you can come find me and i'd love to see it but i i will bet everything on it that everywhere you go you will find trash i don't think a lot of just everyday joes know that this is even a problem and if they don't know that it's a problem they won't do anything about it i don't care what state what country what city you're in this is something everybody needs to hear they need to see it a lot of people are kind of trapped inside and in their own little worlds that they don't even realize what's happening out in the wilderness around our homes that all this trash and everything is getting dumped out there and nothing's happening about it. You know, you don't realize it until you really go out there and you go camping. And you say, well, where can I put my tent, you know? There's all the bottles or cans or stuff all around. I could take you out and personally just show you how close it is to home, how much there is of it, and it wouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out that there's just a lack of effort. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. It's mind blowing actually how much trash is out there and the things that we find from jet skis to boats in the middle of the desert. It's, <laughs> come on. <laughs> boats, surprisingly, seem to be the common thing. Uh, sometimes like fully assembled with like the engine and everything. Sometimes it's just the hull. Boats and like just car bodies. It looks like people probably did like insurance jobs and just like crashed them and left them out there and just rotten stuff. When you go out to Bartlett Flats and there's just trash everywhere, rugs, you know, teddy bears, shoes, people's toilet buckets, they just leave there full, stuff that will never go away if someone doesn't pick it up. It's not as nice to be there and, and it ruins it for us that just wanna be out there and enjoy nature.
And I've been cleaning up enough people's trash out in the wilderness for a while to where you do notice patterns to it. You do come across the trash to where it's like, that was, that, that was an accident. And you'll see that kind of more like the rivers and lakes. I mean, you're on boats, you lose stuff, you lose your flip-flop. Like, stuff happens, you get it. And then, obviously, yeah, you have the straight dump sites where you're seeing just full-blown, someone literally just emptied out their truck full of trash out in the desert. So there's, there's the obvious differences. I've been behind somebody on the trail early in the morning, and I'm watching them do this, and I'm watching them do that. I'll honk my horn, stop and pick it up. I mean, my message is just don't. It's so easy. Why? Why do it? Like, you carried everything in. Why can't you t take everything out? Like, is it really that hard? I mean, it's, it's condensed. All you got to do is throw it in a bag and throw it in the back. Like, it takes all of five minutes of your life. It's kind of probably the nicest way I could say that. I would literally want to just sit him down and just, why? What, what, is, what is your thought process as to why, why are you leaving this trash out here? What is, how is this benefiting anything? Like, I want to know their answer. Everyone's got to take that second thought on what they're doing, you know? Your mom's not out there picking up after you. Oh, I got my blood boiling. <laughs> the effects of just leaving one thing on the ground, it's, it's just a spiral. The older I get, the less and less like free open space there is. Everything just keeps getting gated off or closed off. If this trash keeps growing, the community itself, our freedoms are going to be shrinking very fast. It doesn't matter where you are. Once a trail gets closed down, it doesn't get reopened. Dude, it's that easy for them to just put up a gate and call it, call it good. No one can get through that gate, and it's a wrap. Yeah, so that's the thing. They say until further notice. They don't say until September 1st, 2022. They say until we figure it's gonna be good. And who the heck knows when that's gonna be. It's really sad seeing a ton of the places I used to go when I was younger being closed off and fenced off and you know, state land saying, you guys have really screwed the pooch on this one, or you guys have vandalized, you guys have left stuff out here, and it's, it's hard seeing so many of the places that I've grew up wheeling being closed down. It closed. Forest Service has it closed. <laughs> A lot of trail closures come from the inability of the land managers to keep up with the maintenance. When they get to a place where they can't keep up with that work, whether that then becomes a safety issue, you know, it becomes an environmental issue, whatever it might be, the answer a lot of times is they've got to close that area. Closures of areas is just a really huge problem, and we are always fighting for access. So between trash and the areas getting degraded because of overuse and just not, you know, no, not enough staff, not enough resources for you know, maintenance in general, you know, these areas sometimes have to get closed. Now, we hate seeing closures. We understand when our partners sometimes have to close them. We want to keep them open for everyone. But we can't do it alone. I'm sure they need more people more hands on deck, but that comes at a cost. So it's one of those things that they probably need more help than they have. Money is always where it comes down to. I mean, it's, you know, we, they, they can want all the enforcement in the world. And I mean, and, I, and I've spoken with, with BLM and, and I've spoken with Game and Fish and all of these guys. And it's it, always the, the bottom line is we can't afford it. We put in for this grant, but the government didn't approve it yet, and it's pending, and it's been pending for X amount of years. That's part of the awareness aspect of it, and I think without that, they just, they don't have the resources. If you look at anything from travel management plans or staffing plans within a land management uh, office, they were designed for years ago. You look at what's happened in outdoor recreation in the last 24 months, who would have ever thought? We've seen, you know, 100% increases in the amount of use that the trail systems are getting 
whether that's you know the motorized spectrum that we work with or it's mountain biking e-biking hiking camping hunting fishing name it there's been this increase everywhere there just hasn't been the time to react to that when COVID hit that's that's all we did the silver lining to COVID is that a lot of people discovered the outdoors that had never really spent a lot of time in it before. So now we get to share that with everyone. But with the increased usage, we see that, you know, we need, it doesn't just take care of itself. You know, you can buy a four seat UTV that'll take you to some amazing places that you would never have gotten to see really probably any other way in the past, you know, for a pretty reasonable amount. Um, and I think that's what we've seen. There's traffic jams now. If you get stuck behind the wrong crowd, sometimes a five hour trip can end up taking eight to 10 hours to get all the way up. So there are some negatives, uh, along with more people means more trash. So yeah, I mean, it, it's a constant battle. Well, I'd have to say it's not better. I'd have to say it's worse, you know. I would just have to say it's worse, not to be a smart ass about that question at all, but I would just have to say that with more people comes more trash. It can get dangerous if you have a lot of people on the same trail especially if you have a lot of people who don't know what they're doing. It's a blessing and a curse because again, I mean, it's, it is creating awareness. It's getting people out there, people are seeing it, but at the same time you run into people who don't care at all and all they care about is getting out there and having fun and ripping on these things that go very quickly. I just don't want to see anything closed down over s silly nonsense. If we don't take it upon ourselves to make sure what we do keeps it clean, keeps it open, most importantly, our hobby is gone. Yeah, obviously it's a big deal to us because you know the stuff that we enjoy doing is getting closed down, but I'm also a huge nature lover. So you know, seeing animals dead from eating garbage or getting stuck in garbage. That's I think where people don't understand that it's not just the off-roaders and the hikers and the mountain bikers and, and the photographers and the wildlife preservationists that this affects, it's everybody. And I think that's what's missing in, in the education aspect of it. We need to be out there keeping our wilderness clean, not just the desert, the wilderness, everything, if we're going to keep enjoying it. Simple as that. Otherwise, we're not going to have it to enjoy. Period. Everywhere. I mean, the forest, the oceans, it's all filled with pollution that just needs to come to a halt. Who's going to pick it up? Oh, well, that's luckily we have Dylan that started this to help people get that awareness on not leaving trash behind. Dylan's initiative with Keep Our Desert Clean is amazing. The efforts of Keep Our Desert Clean is huge. I mean, this makes a huge impact on us. Dylan's really done a good job. You know, he's really worked hard on this. He started the page, he did everything, and literally just took the thing and ran with it. Praise goes to Dylan. We would go out off-roading all the time, literally every single weekend we're out there. And while we're out there, we would just see trash all the time and like, well, what the heck, you know, like, might as well throw it in the bed of our truck since nobody else did it type of thing, you know. And Dylan came out with this one time. It was just kind of like an open invite. We were just like, you know, if you post it on, on the Instagram, you know, meeting up, going out here, if you want to come, holler. January 2019, State 48 Off-Road did one of their first uh, big runs, group runs, whatever you want to call it. Dylan was organizing. It was a little run slash cleanup as we were going. I have a picture of us. It was probably about eight trucks maybe, 15 people, 16 people maybe, you know. We're out there just picking up trash. We got our little picker uppers. Dylan was, you know, super pumped on it and was like, this is a great thing. I think we can make a huge difference here. They actually had the idea of cleaning up some trash along the way and wanted me to be the sponsor of it. I had a decent little following and stuff like that. So they were hoping I could get some people out there. So like, sure, why not? And did it and people came and I was like, this is awesome. This is fun. Like I'm out here playing around, wheeling, doing what I do. Yeah, we're cleaning up trash. Like, let's keep this going. So. I just, I took it and ran. He always gets excited when he has these ideas. You know, you can see it in his face. He gets so, so thrilled and so excited. 
Dylan's always doing something. You know, he's always got his hands into something. He's just a handy man. You know, he's always, he's always thinking of something to do. That all came from our parents. You know, they, they always love to go outdoors too. They're really outdoorsy people. So it's, it kind of grew onto us pretty quickly that we had to be outside than indoors, you know? We had a little Jeep to drive around, so we just, we love spending the days outside. And when we could go camping and get up and get out, it was game on, it was a dream. It was so much fun to be out there in the wilderness. You can tell, like, my dad passed this stuff down to me and then seeing my brother passing this kind of stuff down to his kids and me being the general factor in it all, like, I feel amazing about that. Like, it's incredible. So it's, yeah, it's definitely brought our, our families together for sure. Me being an attorney and, and Dylan needing to really make this thing a, a real legal entity, we actually went camping for his birthday, sort of over a campfire, decided what the entity was going to be like, you know, LLC, all this kind of stuff. And now now that we're, we're you know, a real, you know, nonprofit Inc. organization, I became vice president on the board of directors and I'm still stat agent and, uh, and I kind of handle any, any legal stuff that needs to be done and, uh, and go from there. I met Dylan and Ted through basically like social media. Dylan started getting his company out there, so we just kind of linked up and started helping each other out. First event was April 7th, 2019. Two, three, zero, seven, six, five. That date was kind of more of the casual one. That was, I call it an event, but that was maybe 20 of us friends out there cleaning it up. I met Dylan when they did an event. It was actually at Lower Sycamore, and it was a, it was a pretty small event, but we just, we made a, a giant impact on the area. That's where a lot of people just leave garbage from shooting and camping and stuff. And I was able to get them some good sponsorship stuff through raffles from companies that I work with. And then it just went crazy from there. Butcher Jones, the Rolls OHV area out by Saguaro Lake here in Arizona. We did a cleanup out there about January, 2020. And that one we were expecting maybe a hundred people or so tops. We got lunch for 100 people, all of that, and then next thing we know, we're pushing 200. Like, we're overran, parking's getting filled up, the dumpster's overloaded, we're running out of food, we're scrambling. And at that point, I was like, oh, okay. We need to, <laughs> this, this is actually getting some traction, this is going somewhere, so. All of a sudden, all these people show up, and everyone's working together to clean everything up and make the place beautiful again, so it kind of opened everyone's eyes right then and there, like, this is something big that we need to do. That's, that's when a lot more of the we need to start planning for these bigger numbers came in came into play. That was that was the defining moment. It was like, oh, there's there's people behind this. People are coming out to really help us. This is awesome. Oh, look at that beautiful landscape. And then you're like, oh man, what's it's so beautiful? You know what I should do? I should find a perfectly good tree and shit under it and then leave it for someone else to clean up. We can do better. Uh, people bring out a handful of trailers too, so we just fill up trailers and just keep a nice rotation going all the way back to the dumpsters. Dylan's initiative with Keep Our Desert Clean is great because you're concentrating people into a, a smaller area, and that area has become noticeable. That's on his radar. Somebody's told him about it, or somebody from the BLM has mentioned it, but you do, you take a few hundred people and you put them in this trashed area and you wipe it all clean. He doesn't do anything for him though. That's the greatest thing about it is like, dude, he's just like, I just want it just to be clean. Leave it better than it, than you found it. And I'm like, my man, let's go. You get people that you wouldn't normally expect to be hanging out together. I mean, you get there, you get your hikers, you got your Subaru people, you got your Jeeps, you got your Tacomas, your, T your Toyotas, your your fishers, your kayakers, you got all these different people in all different parts of the outdoor world coming together for a general cause and purpose and they all have that same like-mindedness. So it's it's really brought not only the off-roading community but just the whole wilderness community together in a sense, which is it's a great thing to see for sure. I'll just kind of drive through this mattress bed spring right here. Huge party pit all sorts of trash left in it and it's just like i understand like the you know like the thought of going out there's another mattress bed spring right there 
Tread Lightly is obviously they're national and they they sponsor and support me and Keep Our Desert Clean a lot. Tread Lightly is it's literally so big that it's a slogan for Jeep. Tread Lightly is a national nonprofit, and we really have three main things that we focus on. One is stewardship on trail systems, education and, and how to be responsible in terms of an off-road ethic, how to be respectful and responsible when you're out on the trails. And then we do communication and outreach, both for ourselves, other organizations that are doing great work, and a lot of the man, land managers that are trying to promote you know, how, how to act when you're out on the trail system. Like, I get it. It's fun to come out to the desert and have a big old bonfire and stuff like that, but you got to be responsible about it. It's, there's just so much that goes into it. You can't just, there's no trash people. We're not the only ones sitting here with an issue. It's, it's nationwide. It's keep our oceans clean, keep our rivers clean, keep our forests clean. We need to stretch the entire nation because every area is seeing the demands put on the land. It's one of those things like this is just our keep our desert clean, but it's a keep our earth clean type of thing. We shouldn't have to preach it, but we have to preach it because people are slobs. Number one thing is really it's a, the awareness behind it all. I think that's that's the biggest driving force is ingraining it in people's minds so they're not just overlooking that piece of trash that's sitting there on the ground. And especially with the kids and the following generations too, is it's important to keep that open for everyone and for years to come. Is there a, a one-size-fits-all solution? No, there's not. I would love for ABC, NBC, CNN, Fox News to, to say, oh my God, look at all this trash that people are dumping in the desert, because then somebody would notice and somebody would care. Micro changes are going to make macro changes, and that's what we really need. Part of the solution is the line of do your part. Do your part is can take a lot of different forms for a lot of different people. And it only takes one person. If you see somebody drop something, pick it up, do what you can. Literally, you, you reach down, you pick up one old beer can, you throw it in the back of your rig. Sometimes that's all it takes. Every little bit does help, and people seem to feed off of each other. So if you know you see somebody cleaning up trash, then you kind of are like, oh well, they're doing their part. Maybe I should do my part. This has been abused by illegal dumping mainly. Like not really much camping goes on out there or anything like that. And within that section, we can easily fill up three 40 yard dumpsters. I don't think there's a lot of people that know that, you know, people go out there to clean up the desert like this. My big annual ones, yeah, they take easily about three months, if not a little longer to get the ball moving and make sure everything's falling into place. And it's not just the initial, it's follows throughs throughout the time too. Like, I was out there just a week prior to make sure everything's still on track, making sure there's still actually trash where we're going, where we're planning on going and things like that. I can't even imagine how much work he has to put in to make one of these events go on because it literally started off with just, hey dude, like let's go out and we're gonna go clean up the desert. Now it's like, oh, we got months in advance. We're planning this. There's gonna be dumpsters. There's, you know, like we've got this, we got sponsors. And I'm just like, what the, you know, like holy crap, dude. You are amazing. So this land location over here, um, got it up on Google Earth. It's kind of a unique little area. First and foremost is location. Obviously, you can't do a cleanup without having a location. And a lot of that's me going out, traveling around, places I've been, places I've heard of. It's crazy that now to plan these events, we're, we're so big now that we have to figure out locations that can hold the number of volunteers that we're gonna have. We've already been in contact with the Arizona Land Department, State Land Department. We got all their approvals and everything. And after I decide the location, I have to go to the whoever the government agency that's responsible for that land. That can take, depending on the agency, it can take a few days, it could take months. As soon as he gets that done, he reaches out to me and several other people and say, okay, clear off in the future is this. Let's get it done. Good Times Restoration, they reached out and they actually donated uh, some money to us as well too. So nice. some of that can go towards like the tire disposal. People are donating money, I'm buying supplies, so I'm having to track every in and out from a donation to an expense and I gotta make sure I'm doing it right. 
otherwise it's my ass. I'm looking at maybe getting an enclosed trailer, at least borrowing an enclosed one for the supplies, so then the dump trailer can be used at, for the cleanup and at the end of it probably tires. After that, then, I mean, it's all for my supplies and stuff like that. Trailers, vehicles, anything you think that you could use at a cleanup event, I bring that out there so you have to come out with nothing. Then it's also to just the logistics of it, making sure I have maps printed out for the volunteers, the coordinates, the meeting locations. Having somebody like Dylan who puts together a 501c3 pounds the pavement for this stuff all year long. But he does it because he loves to do it and because it's growing so much that that in itself is going to become a solution. It's a nonstop thing, but it's it's fun. Like it, I, There's those times where it's just like, geez, man, I'm, I'm tired. Because, I mean, I work full-time too. I don't, this isn't my full-time job. So it was those days I get home 4 or 5 o'clock and then I'm on my computer sending out emails, doing calls till 10, 11 o'clock that night and just wake up and do it again. So once, once you see those dumpsters filled and people laughing and having a good time out there, like that's... That's what brings it all home. It's, it's, it's worth it for sure. We do a lot of work, you know, a lot of volunteer work. My dad's been huge, huge key player in this thing. He's been coming out with me since the very first one. And he didn't hesitate once, never has. And I highly doubt he ever will, no matter how early I ask him to come over, whether it's be, hey, show up at my house at three in the morning, we gotta be out there by four or five. He's like, okay, okay. <laughs> But he does it, and I mean, without him, we wouldn't have been able to make a lot of things happen. He pulled the big dump trailers out there full of all the supplies and everything that we needed. And I couldn't couldn't do it by myself, that's for damn sure. He's He's been a huge part. Life can get kind of busy sometimes, but when he needs me, I'm there. My brother, he comes out every chance he gets. I mean, he's got two two young daughters, so he's playing, playing that family man life, and I love the dad he's becoming and seeing him raise these kids. And when he comes out there and brings the kids out there, it's. It's this whole nother like light and energy that's going on throughout the whole thing. It's really cool getting them involved and seeing that spark in their eyes too on, you know, doing the right thing and picking this stuff up and not putting it there in the first place. So it's, it's really fun to get them out there. Wake up early <laughs> before the sun comes up and we get out there, start setting up signs so people know where to go, how to get there, lay out whatever we need to, information on where the dumpsters are, the trails we can hit, and wait for people to show up. Chances are some of them will already be there when I wake up. It really just goes to show how important this is to the people who actually use the land. My goal is to make sure that eventually it'll be that important to everyone. This is going to be fun. All right, guys, once you sign in, you get a raffle ticket. Donation is optional for that raffle ticket. Other than that, we have all merchandise for sale, free stuff. Get your supplies here. Once you get your supplies, feel free to just go off and start cleaning up. You're excited, you're nervous, you don't know what's about to happen. You don't know if it's all gonna go to crap because you're not well enough supplied. But then it's just, I don't know, it's... Thank you. Thank you, sure. Thank you guys. It's one of those feelings you just can't like put a finger on, but it's that just that perfect blend of like nerves yet excitement and feeling proud and humbled all at the same time like it's 
I don't know, it's an explosion of different feelings going on. Is that your uh, Yoda? Yeah. I think it's sick. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> it's hard to describe what it feels like. By the time we're up to you know 10 or 12 people, we're getting excited. We're like, ah, we got a big group. An hour later, there's 300 people there. I mean, this is the first time too, we've had like other actual like vendors and stuff set up too, which is, I know, I was like, this which, is like which, legit, which man. It's that, that slow trickle and then the floodgates open. It's, and it's just incredible. Is this here in Free Dad over here? Yeah, I heard it. Is it? fill up our buckets and we take them back to the dumpster, load them in bags and then throw them in the dumpster. You lose track of time when we're out at the cleanups. Like you're like, oh shit, we just cleaned up trash for six hours. We just did seven garbage bags. That's awesome. Like, I didn't, and you don't even think about it because you're out there having fun with your friends. Site four slash boat on the map. It should, you should see it on the main road. Help you in a little bit. <laughs> you're gonna say you're tired, but you're gonna say I feel damn good, dude. Cause you're gonna look in that dumpster and you're gonna see so much. You're gonna see tires everywhere, and that's how it should be. You should feel damn good about yourself for helping clean up. These are just everyday folks that like to be off road. You know, they're not. They're it, there's nothing really that stands out. It's not like it's some, you know, everybody's coming in in these super expensive overland rigs or everybody's coming in in, in dumpsters. You know, they, everybody just brings what they have and everybody gets along with each other. There's no Ford versus Chevy or anything like that. It's just, these are all just people. They all have a common love for being off-road and they all want to make sure that these trails stay open. So yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. It's one in the end to where you step back and you just take that deep breath and you're like, we did this, guys. Look at this. This is amazing. Thank you all of you for coming out here and spending the day with us and really helping us clean up a lot of trash here. Really appreciate it, guys. Another one done. Feels great, man. Feels great. I'm exhausted, but it's a huge relief and weight off my shoulder. I mean, it's a completion of something epic, so it feels Feels great. So if we read either one of those numbers on either one of those tickets, you win a prize. We filled up three 40-yard, we overflowed three 40-yard dumpsters. Pretty sure we had some people still hauling some stuff off in their personal trailers that they brought out and stuff too. I think the count on tires was about 44, somewhere between like 40 and 50 tires that we pulled out. So, I mean, that was all within a few hours. I mean, cleaning itself was nine till about noon. So all of that happened within a few hours. I'm excited to find out what the actual weight is. So that's, that's always chomping at the bit, waiting to get those numbers in type deal. To have an event of this magnitude with all these folks and all the combined hours, it's just exponential. You know, we have 300 employees. There's no way that we could, even if we got all of us together, you know, our employees are the same number as what came out today in volunteers. That's amazing. So this is huge. Just a one day event, just boom, go out and just hit it hard and get all this trash out. Um, it's just a huge, huge undertaking. And it's, it's, I really can't tell you how much it means to us. We couldn't do this by ourselves. And so really thanks so much to keep our desert clean. I think we brought in a lot, a lot of newer faces, which is great. That shows that the awareness is spreading and we're actually making a movement out here. All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, appreciate everything, for man. Everything. Oh, thank great, you, man. Turnout. It's growing. It's definitely growing for sure. It's not, there's definitely not an end in sight. I think that eventually it becomes a national thing. 
keep our desert clean as almost an umbrella organization for local clubs, local cleanup organizations, things like that. Over the next few months, it's really focusing on the nonprofit itself to really establish a strong structure for that. I mean, stronger the nonprofit structure is, the more cleanups we can have and ideally build it to a point to where we can have multiple cleanups on the same weekend ran by different people in different locations. There's a lot of times where the off-road communities may be almost too humble uh, and they don't want to talk about that. I think we're at really at a place where we need to make sure we're talking about all the work that's being done. If you're watching this, obviously you have some kind of interest in the outdoors and stuff. You have some favorite places. If you have somewhere you love, keep it that way. Keep it so you actually love to go and continue to go back out there. Keep that image beautiful. Everywhere needs love. Go to the place you love and put some work into it. I love this. this is my life, man. I love this. This is my lifestyle. Like off-roading, being outside, being in nature, like it's it's who I am. And it's what I what I love to do. And I want to keep coming out here for years and years to come. I want future generations to be able to enjoy what I'm doing here. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that is by cleaning stuff up, keeping it looking clean out here. It's always been instilled in us that hey, you pick up your garbage, hey, you pack out more than you bring in. My message is just just don't just don't throw stuff out there. You know, it's, it's as easy as that. If we own public lands and we want to take that stance, we have a responsibility to take care of it. We can't clean all the trash. There's no way we can. It's, it's impossible. But what's going to change the difference and make a difference is changing the mindset of everybody. It's 